So welcome back, everybody. Um, just like yesterday, uh, you know, I encourage you to ask questions at any time. Um, you know, you you can. I'll try to add, make some points where I ask to see if there are questions, and also uh, Brendan has generally generously uh, volunteered to help moderate. So you can also write on the Zoom chat. Uh, I think I missed a lot of questions on the Zoom chat, Zoom chat yesterday, but that's because it's just going too fast. So um, if you have any questions that are not answered, just ask them on the Slack, uh, and I'll try to get to them later. Um, all right, so yes, so this is kind of where we are um, in our plan. So yesterday we mostly motivated um, probabilistic programs. Um, I introduced uh, some applications of these things and the focus for these lectures. And we also talked about a lot of uh, kind of mathematical preliminaries, like different kinds of constructions on distributions that um, we're going to use uh, today and tomorrow. Um, at the very end of the lecture yesterday, we were kind of just introducing this PYL language, uh, this probabilistic imperative language. Um, and so we'll kind of get back there uh, and continue where we left off. Right. So uh, just to kind of review, um, you know, PYL is uh, a basic imperative language um, with a new command for random sampling. Okay. So for instance, here is a kind of a basic program. Um, so initially it says R to be equal to zero. And then while R is less than four, you're going to continually roll uh, a fair dice. So remember that this is a fair dice roll. So it signs one six probability to one all the way up to six. Um, so kind of what's going to happen after this program is that you're going to get a uniform sample form numbers four or five and six, right? So as soon as you get four or five or six, you will stop um, the loop. Um, it takes a bit of an argument to show that this is actually a uniform sample, um, but it is. Uh, you can also view this program as generating a conditional distribution. Okay, so uh, we were in the middle of introducing the, the syntax of PYL, and I'm just going to briefly review some of the stuff we already did. So first of all, we have expressions. Um, so these are like, you, have, you can either have program variables in the first line. Uh, you can have Booleans, uh, Boolean expressions, or numeric expressions. Uh, of course, everything can be extended uh, if you like additional operations. Uh, none of these is like very special that it must have these operations. Um, and we also talked about uh, these distribution expressions, which are kind of the built-in uh, distributions of the language. So we have a fair coin flip. Um, That's the first one called flip. Uh, we have a p-biased coin flip. Um, this is like a biased coin flip where the probability of seeing true is going to be p and the probability of seeing false is going to be one minus p. So you might have p equals one quarter and you have kind of an unfair coin. And we have this uh, roll kind of distribution where you roll like uh, one die. Okay, so you get a number from one to six uh, with equal probability. All right, so you know these are kind of the three running examples of distributions we're going to use. Uh, so that where we kind of left off is that we were going to talk about the commands uh, of the language. So Again, this is probably not going to be very surprising if you've kind of seen an imperative language before, like a core language. Um, but though, for those of you that may not have seen this before, um, we have a bunch of commands. Uh, so the first one is skip, which is a command that does nothing. Um, we have an assignment command that uh, assigns some expression uh, to a variable. Um, the third command here is a sampling command. So this is essentially the only new uh, feature of pwhile where essentially you have a distribution expression and you want to draw a sample, a random sample from that distribution and store it into variable x. Okay, and then finally we have the, the usual imperative commands for sequencing, semicolon, uh, and conditionals, uh, if then else, and of course, uh, while loops. Okay, so while some expression is, is true, you're going to keep on looping. Okay, so uh, again, this is a kind of a very bare bones imperative language. Um, it's already enough to kind of show some interesting examples of, of randomized programs and uh, kind of verifying, you know, properties of these programs is already not very easy. Uh, but there's, of course, many possible extensions that you could consider. So you might consider um, having procedures, for instance, um, you know, procedure abstraction. Uh, you might consider having pointers and heaps or memory allocation, things like this. Uh, so here, kind of, you know, all you have are kind of global variables uh, and you can assign to them. Um, but kind of for the scale of programs that we're going to be considering, uh, reminding that many randomized programs are already very interesting when they're very small, um, this kind of language is already more than sufficient to, to kind of express these things. Okay, cool. 
So I'm going to first give, uh, you know, the, the main thing we're going to do today is give a first semantics for this language P while, which I'm going to call the monadic semantics. Um, again, this is not really standard terminology, though I think it makes sense. So I want to give this semantics in uh, some detail so you can see how this works. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, one verification method that's kind of well matched to the semantics. So this is the method of weakest pre-expectations uh, by Morgan McIver. Okay, so oh, sorry, can I ask a, maybe it's a very, very naive question, but I mean, I came to the notion of a monad essentially in a function programming language, and that's where it's, it's you would describe that you know you need a monad in some sense because uh, you need to. Am I missing something very simple? Like, do you even need monads in, uh, or am I really missing the basic concept of a monad uh, in, in imperative? Why do you even need one? Is, is, sorry. Is it, right. Is it a... so, so, I mean, I, I'm just using monadic semantics as just kind of the name. Like, um, uh, okay. I think there are some reasons why you want to have this. Okay. Uh, but I think it is, you know, for briefly, briefly commenting, I think it's worth mentioning that the concept of monad is useful in many other contexts besides uh, just functional programming. Um, you know, the, as typically used in per, perhaps Haskell, like it is a way to encapsulate effects, uh, right. but there's many other uh, useful reasons why you might want to um, have uh, to use a, a monad structure. So okay. uh, for our purposes, um, you know, we will use what's called a distribution monad, uh, which are this kind of unit and bind operation we talked about last time. Right. And I'm just going to consider those to be kind of a convenient API for constructing distributions, right? And okay at the meta level, right? So in, in our in our wild language, we will not have monadic types or, or like do notation or whatever. Um, we'll just be using this to kind of build distributions and kind of define the semantics. Okay. But I wouldn't get too hung up on the word monadic here because it, it's just okay. just the name. Okay. Cool, any other questions before I, I continue? Okay, let's, uh, let's go on. Okay, so I'm going to give a semantics to uh, this PYL language. Um, I first have to define a bunch of things. So um, the way I want to set this up is that the uh, programs are going to modify memories. So a memory uh, I'm going to call M, um, it's a map assigning a value, say V, to each variable X. Okay, so you imagine you have a fixed set of program variables. Imagine these are all the global variables you're allowed to use in your program. Again, this is a very idealized uh, kind of core language. Uh, and a memory is just a simple map from uh, that maps each variable to a value. Right? Um, so each variable gets a value that might be an integer or a boolean or, or something like this. Um, so you know, more formally, you know, I'm considered the set uh, big M, uh, which is going to be the set of all functions from the set of variables x uh, to the set of variables value. Uh, sorry, the set of values v. So x is variables, uh, v is a set of values, okay, which might be you know numeric constants or uh, Booleans, right? So programs are going to modify these things, right? So uh, in kind of an imperative language, uh, you would expect that a program takes in a memory as input, and then it transforms the memory and produces some output memory. That's kind of the one very common semantics of imperative programs, kind of input to output takes initial state of the memory, might change some stuff, and then produces the final state of the memory, at least assuming it terminates, okay? which it might not. All right. so. Now we're going to kind of define the semantics of our language in layers, right? So as I presented, the you know this, the language is uh, presented in several layers. So there's expressions first, uh, then there's distribution expressions, um, and then there's kind of commands or statements. Okay, so we're going to kind of define the meaning of each of these things um, uh, mathematically, right? So um, the value of an expression uh, can depend on the memory because an expression can mention variables, right? So for instance, the, the expression x plus one. Uh, this is a valid expression. Uh, clearly, the value of this thing is going to depend on the current memory m, right? So, if the current memory has x equals zero, then you know x plus one should kind of mean one. Uh, if the current memory has x equals forty-two, then the value of like x plus one should be forty-three. Okay. So, accordingly, like in our semantics of expressions, we're going to take the memory as a parameter. So, I'm going to find this kind of semantic brackets, the square brackets thing, uh, says that you you give it an expression e and a memory m. And we'll give you back a value, okay, which is the value of that expression in the given memory, right? So for, for a small example here, uh, expression is x plus one. Let's suppose that I have a memory m where m of x equal to three. So that means x is uh, the value of x in the memory is three. And then I define uh, kind of the semantics of x plus one in memory m uh, is defined to be equal to the semantics of x plus the semantics of one. 
which is defined again equal to be m, m of x plus one, which is equal to four. Okay, so three plus one equals four. Okay, so you know I'm not going to give the full definition of the, of the semantics of expressions because it's fairly straightforward. Um, if you have not seen this before, you can try doing this as an exercise, essentially by induction on the structure of the expression. You're going to define for every expression uh, in some memory what is the value. Okay, and it's largely straightforward, like like this. Okay, so expressions just the same as in regular wild language. Uh, if you've uh, more familiar with that. So distributions, um, you know, in our setting, it's actually in the, previous, in, in, the, in the previous slide, essentially, you can think of it as, uh, you know, functions with uh, constant functions that like uh, the, the square bracket one M is like a constant function. Is that reasonable? Yes, yes. So the, the definition of square bracket one on M is always going to return the, uh, the number one. Yes, okay. uh, but that's not always the case. For instance, for X, it's not the constant function. Right. So okay, so what do we put inside the square bracket? If it's a if it's a constant, what comes out is going to be that same constant essentially, right? Uh, yes, I mean there's some distinction between the abstract syntax and maybe the like we're interpreting like you know I think of the one as kind of syntax of the programming language, so it's syntax that uh, you would write or it's, right. it's just code. Uh, so but the other one on the on the right side uh, over here is the mathematical one. Let's right. say the right. mathematical number one. Right. Okay. So. Good, good. So the purpose of kind of the semantics is to interpret a piece of program code into some mathematical thing. Okay, so the thing inside the bracket is going to be some uh, some syntax uh, that a priori has no meaning. Um, but we give it interpretation to map it to some mathematical thing that kind of we already understand, such as the natural numbers or something. Okay, cool. So, right. So containing distributions um, in our setting, you might have noticed that the distribution expressions uh, actually are, are kind of simplified in that they don't really have any parameters, okay? So we have that bias coin flip P, but there I'm thinking of P as just being a constant. So it's always some number. Uh, in particular, that P cannot mention another program variable and, and things like this. So the upshot of this is that in our kind of language as we present so far, the distribution expressions, their semantics does not depend on the, on, on the actual memory, right? So they, they don't mention any variables. So they don't depend on the, the program state. It's not hard at all to kind of extend the semantics to allow uh, the distribution expression to mention kind of variables. So you might maybe uh, you know draw a random number and then use that random number as the bias of another coin flip, right? But for simplicity, we're just not going to do this right now. Um, uh, it's not hard to extend the semantics. So the but the upshot is that you know so the the semantics of the expressions is I'm going to use this overload the notation for the semantic brackets. Uh, it's going to take in some D expression, which might be flip or flip P or roll, and it will give you back a mathematical distribution on values. Right? So again, remember that this mathematical distribution we defined last time, it's a function from values to interval zero one, uh, like a regular mathematical function. Um, so again, kind of it's hopefully not too hard to imagine how you can define uh, this operation um, on on D expressions, right? So. For the example, the de-expression flip, this is the fairy coin flip, right? So you can just define um, the, the meaning of flip to be a distribution mu, which is the distribution over the mathematical booleans, um, where mu of true is equal to mu of false is equal to one half, okay? So I'm just defining this, the meaning of this piece of text flip. Uh, it corresponds to the mathematical distribution that has half chance of returning true and half chance of returning false. Okay. Okay. So expressions and the expressions are, are kind of simpler parts. The more interesting parts of the language, of course, is for the, the commands. So there are at least two reasonable choices. Um, there's actually more, but there's two reasonable choices for giving semantics to commands in P while. Um, one choice, uh, sorry, this is, these are really just the two choices. It's not the first choice. So the first choice is that a cam command takes a single memory as input. And the second choice is the command takes a distribution over memories as the input. Okay, so some of the output of the command uh, is going to be a distribution because the command is randomized. It might use some random stuff. Uh, so the output must be randomized, okay, um, or should be randomized. Uh, however, the input to the command, um, there is this important choice. Um, like, should we think about a command as taking a single memory as input or rather taking a distribution of memories as input? These are both kind of valid choices, and they are in some sense uh, quite closely related. Um, sorry. Uh, so what we're going to do for this lecture is going to take the first choice. Okay, so this is what I'm going to call the monadic semantics. Um, 
again, don't get, don't get too hung up on this, this terminology. Uh, it's just, just a name that I need to call this something. Um, I'm going to use this kind of, uh, kind of round bracket kind of thing. The notation is, is not the best um, to indicate that um, the command takes in a single memory as input and produces a distribution uh, on memories. Okay, so uh, you can think about it as taking like a point and producing a bunch of stuff. That's why you have this like triangle round thing. Okay, if I'm not sure if this mnemonic is gonna it's gonna help you or not, but maybe it will. Okay, so this mnemonic semantics, the type of this is going to be, it's gonna take in a command, something in C. So this is a program, a keyboard program. It's gonna take in one initial memory and it will produce a distribution over output memories. Okay, so this is the de desired type. And unlike the previous semantics for you know, expressions and the de expressions, I'm going to go through and define this in much more detail um, because this is the kind of interesting bit of how you define the semantics of this language. Okay, so, right, so, Yes. Uh, are there any questions at this point before I, I start presenting the semantics? Let's let's see some cases, and then maybe things will become clear if things are confusing. So we're going to re like we're going to use some of the constructions we described last time uh, on distributions. So uh, for whatever reason, last time you like didn't uh, kind of didn't quite follow or kind of zoned out briefly. I'm going to review a few things. So uh, the first thing we use is kind of this this uh, direct distribution or this kind of unit. Uh, which is a distribution that produces uh, a particular element with probability one. Okay, so uh, you know I have some element a, and then unit of a is a distribution that always returns um, a. Okay, so it has probability one of if x equal to a, otherwise probability zero, otherwise. Okay, so we're going to repeatedly use this kind of construction when defining the semantics. So. It's always good to start with the simple cases. So let's start with just skip. So the skip command is the simplest command. Um, the idea is that this command should take in input a single memory uh, because all commands take in a single memory as input and the output is gonna be a distribution that always returns M, okay? So kind of using the, this unit operation we had before, uh, we can define the semantics of skip to be this. So uh, the semantics of skip, if you plug in some initial memory you're gonna get back unit of M, which is a distribution over memories that always returns M, okay? So hopefully this is, this is fairly intuitive. The, the skip command just takes in some initial memory. It like, uh, and doesn't do anything to it. Um, in our semantics, it must produce a distribution over output memory, so we can't just return M as is. So we just wrap it in a distribution and say it always, this distribution always returns M 100% uh, of the time. Like a singleton list, like a singleton list, for example. In the, Sorry. Like a singleton list. When we're so, uh, in uh, so, so I, I'm I'm thinking of distributions as still being functions from memories to zero one. Okay. Yeah. So this is the function that always returns one. Uh, so sorry, it always returns one when you plug in m, and returns zero if you plug in anything else. Okay. So that's the right side. Okay. Uh, next one is assignment. Okay, so here it's very similar to skip. Um, the only difference is that the memory input memory is going to be modified, right? So uh, the intuition is that okay, this command is going to take in some input memory m, and it's going to output a distribution that always returns m, where the variable x is updated to point to v or not to hold v. Let's say not to point to v, and v is the original value of the expression e and m. Okay, so maybe showing the command is going to be a bit a bit clearer. So the assignment command is here. So this is the assignment. I'm going to assign expression e to the variable x. Um, now, if I run this on initial memory m, I'm going to get, again, a distribution, but a, again, a unit distribution um, located at m where x holds v, right? where v is going to be the semantics of e uh, in m. Right? So kind of v is initial value of e in the initial memory. And when I do this assignment command, what I'm essentially doing is I'm updating um, x to hold v instead. Um, this is update is deterministic, but again, because I must return a distribution over memories, I'm going to wrap the whole thing in a unit again. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so it's very much like skip, but you're just you're actually doing an update, like um, you're you're possibly changing um, the value of of x in the memory to something else, or or not. It might be the same. Okay. 
So, you know, for our next few commands, we're again gonna reuse some, some operations we had before. Uh, so it'll be useful to use this map operation as well. Um, if you don't quite remember, uh, the way this works is that um, I have a function from A to B, and then map of F is gonna lift the function to take a distribution of A's to a distribution of B's, uh, where you can kind of think about this operationally, this distribution of B is gonna be obtained by sampling something from, from the initial distribution over A's, and then applying F. Or mathematically, you could define it like this. I think now with a typo, it has been fixed. Okay, so let's try to do the semantics of sampling, okay, the sampling command. So here we have initial memory M, as always, there's a single memory. Um, and I'm gonna draw a sample from some distribution D. Uh, here I'm using the semantic brackets to indicate that this is gonna be a mathematical distribution. It's gonna be distribution over numbers, let's say. I'm gonna call the result of the sample V. And then given V, I'm gonna map this V to the updated output memory uh, where, where M kind of has X holding V instead. Okay, so you can kind of think about this in a few ways. Uh, you know, one way is to say, um, you know, how do I do a sampling command? Well, I first sample something from the distribution D, the mathematical distribution, and then whatever value I get, I kind of plug it into M uh, in, in the variable X. So I have initial memory M, you know, I've sampled something from the distribution D, I got V. So now I'm going to produce the final memory M with X updated to hold V. Okay, that's, that's this, this thing over here. Okay, so you can, you can see this like, like this. Um, this is in, in more symbols. Um, I'm gonna say that let's let this mapping function F, it takes any value of the sample uh, to a memory M where X holds V. Uh, and then now if I have a sampling command and I plug in some memory M, I'm just gonna map this function F over the distribution D. Okay, so uh, if you're looking at the types, you know, this is, uh, this is distribution over values. Um, F goes from values to memories. So the result of this whole thing is gonna be a distribution over memories. Okay, so at least, at least the type is right. Um, but I hope uh, you can convince yourself that this is also like a reasonable thing to do and kind of intuitively reflects what you think should happen when you do a sampling command and store into X. Any questions about this? Yeah, I think the intuition in terms of list that is given by Professor Ustalo is useful here because if you think of the square bracket D as a list, then you have the map of F takes the, uh, you know, applies the F to every element of the list. Isn't that right? That's essentially what we're getting over here. I think uh, you can certainly, you can certainly think of it as a list. I'm not really sure if that's, uh, Clear, though maybe it's a bit more concrete. Um, I'm used to thinking about the, the distribution as just being a function. Um, and right. that's, that's, also, that's also fine, I think. You can also map over functions. Uh, if it, if it, you know, if for concreteness, you can think about this distribution as really just a list of things. Um, but I think you know, it's, it's equivalent to think about it as a function as well. Right. Okay, other questions? We're starting to get into the probabilistic stuff. I don't see any questions on the chat. So I think okay, cool, sounds good. All right, so let's continue. Um, you know, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get into kind of sequencing. Um, this, from this, for this part, it will be useful to use this bind construction we talked about last time. So again, a quick reminder, so this bind instruction has a few components. Um, so first you, you, you have to have a distribution over A's. And then you have a function uh, from A to a distribution over B's. So this is a randomized function you could think of that takes in an A and gives you a random B perhaps. Um, then bind new F is gonna be a distribution over B's. And intuitively it's like the sequential composition uh, where you first sample something from mu, then you apply F to get a distribution over B's. So and then you can sample from that as well. Or mathematically it's this given by this expression which we kind of unpacked uh, last time. Okay. So this is useful for sequential composition, uh, among other things. So here, you know, again, we have input memory M and intuition is I want to run the first command on M. It's gonna give me a distribution over memories called mu1. I wanna sample a memory M prime from mu1 and then bind this memory into the second command to get the final distribution. Okay, so I'm going to use, think of bind as sequential composition, um, modeling this two steps. So, kind of in, in more notation, um, the definition can be given like this. So my sequential composition is C1 followed by C2. Uh, the initial memory is M. 
And then I'm going to bind two things together, right? So I need first a distribution over memories. That's this first bit. You know, I'm running C1 on initial memory M. I'll get a distribution over outputs. That's the first distribution. Um, then I'm going to bind that into the next function, which takes in uh, a memory and gives a distribution on memories. And that function there is just C2. Okay. So I'm using here bind to kind of encode what sequential composition should mean. Um, questions about this? I mean, so you'll see that like a lot of the constructions we talked about last time, we're going to be using them in this fashion to kind of define distributions um, yeah, as part of defining the semantics. So that's uh, that's why we kind of introduced these, these ways of building distributions and combining things uh, because we're going to use these things um, at the meta level, if you like, to, to define these distributions. Okay. Okay, so sequencing, um, there's only two more to go. There's conditionals and then loops. So conditionals, um, it's actually not too hard to do conditionals. Um, so again, you have an input that's a single memory M, and then in the idea is that if the guard is true in M, uh, you're going to run the first command C1, the first branch. Otherwise, you will run the second command C2. So for this kind of intuition, you have to note that it's really important and also really useful that M here is a single memory. It is not a distribution over memories. So this is one kind of aspect about the, the semantics that we've chosen, that you can do this kind of case analysis on the input. Right? So, uh, if the input was a distribution over memories, then you couldn't just if you, you couldn't use this kind of intuition, right? Because you couldn't just say, you know, either I run C1 or I run C2, uh, because input might be like a distribution that has, you know, partially M, uh, partially guard is true or the partially guard is false. Uh, but because of the semantics we're kind of designing here, the input is always a single memory. Uh, we can do this case analysis okay, with, with no problem. So this is a simplifying thing that makes it easier to define the semantics. So then the standard of conditionals is given by this. So, you know, if E then C1 LC2, that's my program. Um, M is my initial memory. Um, and then I just do the case analysis like, like I mentioned, right? So if um, the guard is true in, in M, you know, if the semantics of E in M is true, uh, I'm gonna just return the distribution I get by running the first command, uh, the first branch. Otherwise, if the semantics of uh, E and M is false, I'm just going to return a distribution I get by running the second branch on M. Okay, so this is a, just a case analysis um, defining what is the right output distribution you should produce um, given input M to your, to your program. I have a question. Um, yes. The, does the memory location M contain only one variable? Uh, M like, can, can uh, sorry, go ahead. No, so when we are, when we are saying that E evaluated at uh, M, the, the guard E evaluated at M, um, does that M contain only one variable is what I was not sure of. Sorry, so it, it's a good question. So in general, M can, can, can contain many variables. So we have a finite set of variables. I'm calling it big X. Um, this, this guard here, it might not be a variable, right? It might be uh, X plus Y or something, um, or you know, X plus Y equal to zero or something. Um, it might involve multiple variables. Okay, and so right. we would but assume, the, so yeah. E as an expression might be X plus Y equal to zero. And yeah. we would want the, the single memory location M to contain the representation of X and Y values. Right, right. So, so M, yeah, I think of M as having, giving you the value of X and also the value of Y. So it kind of contains the value of any variables that you might use in your program, which okay. might be more than one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. Um, yep. Here, uh, are we assuming that E is not a randomized expression? Uh, mm -hmm. Right, so we're we are assuming that E is so. There's there's two points here to make at least. So the short answer is that yes, we're assuming that E is not a randomized expression. So E is an expression, uh, like an expression grammar I showed before. You know, you have you have variables, um, you have booleans, and you have uh, distribution expressions. Oh, sorry, sorry. You have variables, booleans, and natural numbers. You don't have distribution expressions, so you can't have E to be flip or or roll or something like this. Okay. Or even uh, sample, so sample from uh, a, a flip or roll. Right, so you also cannot have that, right? So if you look at the, the grammar I presented before, uh, expressions cannot mention commands. So sampling is a command and expressions cannot mention commands. Yeah, yeah, sorry, so you can't have you. a sampling instruction in, inside an expression. Um, that's just not allowed by the grammar. 
Um, another point that I think is, is worth making if you haven't seen the semantics in this kind of style uh, is that you probably shouldn't think about E as being randomized or deterministic. Like, uh, like E is just some bit of program text. It's some syntax that by itself doesn't mean anything, right? Like um, we're, what we are doing here is we are kind of defining the semantics of these things, which means we are giving meaning to each of these pieces of syntax. Uh, but a priori, like E might represent a randomized thing or a deterministic thing or whatever. It's just, it's just a bit of syntax that doesn't mean anything by itself. Okay, so in our in the semantics that we're doing right here, we've given a meaning where the meaning of E in a memory is a single value. So it, it's not going to be a distribution over anything. Uh, but that's kind of the choice that we're doing here. Uh, that's how we define the semantics. Um, but a priori, like E is just some bit of text that doesn't mean anything. Okay, okay other questions? Okay, that will continue and we will do loops. Um, so this is kind of the, the most interesting or, or you know complicated part depending on your point of view. Um, if we don't follow exactly what's going on here, you know, it's, it's fine. You can understand rest of the lecture without understanding details here. Uh, but I think it's worth at least seeing one example of how you can give a semantics to loops. The reason that loops are complicated is that loops have the possibility of non-termination. Um, so you have to be careful about how you define the semantics so that you can faithfully model uh, possibly non-terminating programs as well. Okay, so semantics of loops, uh, we'll first give one first try, uh, which will not work, uh, but then we'll fix it with a second try. So, okay, the input is gonna be a memory M, again, as always. Um, now the loop here is while well, E do C, that's gonna be the, the program I'm trying to give a semantics to. So one idea is that, you know, okay, what is a loop? Well, it's intuitively, it should be the same thing as a sequence of if then else instructions, right? So if, if E is true, then run C, semicolon, if E is true, then run C, and then, you know, you do this, uh, you know, forever, pretty much, okay? Or arbitrarily long, you just keep unrolling this thing and then you have a sequence of stuff. Okay, so, you know, one natural try is just to say, well, maybe we can define the semantics of this thing. You know, I need to find some output distribution, right? You know, I've given M into this, this loop. Like, what is the distribution of outputs? What should it be? So one kind of initial try you might find, you know, you know thinking that, you know, while E do C is going to be this infinite sequence of if-then-else's, maybe I can define this as some kind of limit, okay? Or, or again, you know, the meaning of this limit is not really clear. Uh, but, you know, I have if E then C to the N, where by that I mean the N-fold co uh, sequential composition of if E then else, um, you know, uh, maybe I can take the semantics of that and apply it on M and I'll have a distribution and I somehow take the limit of each of these distributions. Okay, so this is kind of well-defined because we've already defined the semantics of sequential composition and also the semantics of if then else, right? So the thing on, on like this part here between the semantic brackets uh, is well-defined. We've, we've already done that before. Um, now, the question now is, you know, what exactly is this limit? Um, and, you know, does this definition uh, work? Okay. Um, Justin, you have uh, a couple questions about um, the semantics uh, of a chain of uh, commands. Uh, is this supposed to be associative um, through bind? Uh, Ariel asks. Uh, so right, I that's a good, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a good question. So yes, so I, I didn't quite, so okay, I, I, this part I should have explained also is that the semantics of the command is definitely given by the semantics of its subcomponents, right? So uh, you're right that when I wrote this way, there is some ambiguity in how the, the semicolon is going to associate. Like, uh, do you consider the first two uh, and the rest or, or so on? Um, it turns out that in under our semantics, it doesn't make a difference how you choose this uh, because bind is associative essentially by, by properties of the monad that uh, it doesn't matter how you associate this sequential composition. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of avoid the issue by just saying like, you can choose any association you want for semicolon and it, it won't matter for all for our, in our setting. In general, it might matter, but in our setting, it does not matter. That's, that's a good question. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Prasant asks, uh... A uh, single memory location, what does it mean to have a distribution over memory location? So like in the beginning, you were talking about um, to have these two choices, you know, distribution over um, multiple memories or one memory. And then uh, does every distribution imply uh, that distributions over the variables contained in the memory locations? I'm not sure 
um, if that's clear. But, uh, right. So I think you, I'm, I'm, I've tried to set things up so everything is kind of uh, defined in terms of like very basic operations. So uh, so let me try to say, so you have mem well, memories are maps from variables to values. Okay? So you have a fixed set of variables and a fixed space of possible values. And every memory is some function from, from uh, uh, variables to values. Okay, so you have the set of all memories. This is again, another set. Uh, and you can consider distributions over this set, right? So uh, distribution over memories is gonna take every memory um, to a probability because a distribution over anything takes uh, something to a probability. Okay, so if you wanna think about it, like I've tried to find everything so that it's just, it just functions all the way down. So it's just more and more functions. Um, a distribution over memories is, is a distribution over uh, functions from variables to values. And distribution means it maps every thing, every memory to a number between zero and one. Okay. So that's what I would okay. mean by distribution over memories. Yeah, I think, I think that's clear. Um, maybe if, if not, uh, for some can follow up. But um, uh, Chuta asked, I think you might have touched on this yesterday. Um, do, does this need to converge, this limit? Uh, so, right, uh, we, will, we will get to that soon. We will get that just next. It's a very natural question to ask. Um, okay. Okay. So yeah, so far as I've said, yeah, none of this, I'm not even sure if this really makes sense. Okay, so, right, so this is what I, what I have. So yeah, the, the question uh, anticipated here is that, you know, does the does limit actually exist? Or what, what does it even mean for this limit to exist? Um, I, I'm not gonna form and define what this limit means uh, because I don't wanna get too far uh, into here. Uh, it's not hard to do as well, um, but I just wanna try to explain to you why this limit, you know, doesn't exist or, or like it should not exist. Okay, so this, you know, if the limit doesn't exist, then this is a bad definition because the thing on the right doesn't even exist. And I want to define it to be a distribution. So if the thing on the right is not a distribution, it doesn't exist, then this is not a really good definition. It's a bad definition. Okay, so here's a simple example I'm going to use to try to convince you that the limit doesn't actually exist uh, without defining what the limit means. So this program here is not even going to be um, probabilistic. Okay. Um, so it's just going to be a non-terminating program. It says while true, like forever, I'm going to do, uh, if X is true, then I'm going to flip X to be false, else I'm going to flip X to be true. Okay, so uh, this program intuitively just, you know, forever, it's going to flip, it's going to toggle X, right? It'll, you know, from X goes to false, then to true and the false, and it will just do this forever because the guard is always going to be true. Like no matter how many times you run, like uh, you're never going to exit this loop. All right, so you know this is a, it, it doesn't have any random sampling, but it's still a pwhile program because it's if it's the grammar, this is a valid program. Um, so you can try to like apply this previous limit kind of thing I showed and see like what should happen. Okay, so uh, you know if that limit exists, then we should be able to define the semantics of this loop in terms of that sequence of distributions. Um, but you can kind of try to convince yourself that this is not going to work. Like there's no sensible limit you can take here. Right, so uh, let's suppose that the input initial memory M has, uh, I don't know, M of X equals true. So X is initially true. Uh, as you go into the loop, it's gonna be false, then it's gonna be true again, then false again, and then true again uh, as you go on. Right, so um, you can kind of try to verify that this thing here, which is the, um, kind of running N iterations of the loop, what is the final state of the memory? Um, it has probability one on M, um, one on input memory for even N, and uh, probably one on M with X switched to false for odd N. So you can kind of think about this as uh, a sequence of distributions. Again, these are distributions um, that kind of flips between two distributions. So the first distribution has, you always return a memory with X is true. The second distribution, you always return a memory with X equals false. Okay, so this, this distributions kind of oscillate um, and um, there's kind of, I'm going to say that there's no sensible limit you can take here. Okay, so, uh, you know, what is going to be the final state? Like, is it going to be 50 50 uh, x equals true and false? I mean, it could be, but, you know, that would be kind of strange because this, this program here is not even probabilistic, right? So, why should it have 50% of anything? Like, it, it should always return the same thing. It's deterministic. Um, and, you know, maybe you want to say it returns a, a sub distribution that returns probability zero of anything. Uh, and that's, that's a little bit more sensible because kind of nothing is ever returned from this, this loop. 
Um, but that's also doesn't seem like a reasonable limit, right, of, of mu n, right? As we've defined it, like you have the sequence of distribution that oscillates. So when you take the limit, like why should it suddenly become zero? Um, okay. Does this example make some kind of sense? I think so. Um, yesterday, I, you talked a little bit about um, things that uh, don't terminate, or well, I mean, I guess everything terminates, but the dark matter kind of um, yeah. question. So does that arise here, or do you have any way of right. dealing right. with right. that? Right, so that's, that's what we're going to essentially do, is that we want to, like, you can maybe, you can probably guess that you, know, you I don't know if you can guess. <laughs> if I told you that the, the, the output distribution here is gonna be the zero sub distribution, which assigns probability zero to every single memory, um, you might be convinced that this is a reasonable output memory, right? Because this loop never terminates, right? So what is the distribution over final outputs? Well, it has probability zero of returning anything. Like it never returns anything at all, right? Um, so in some, some sense, the, the missing mass, which is one in this case, uh, it's a probability that you don't terminate. Um, but all I'm trying to motivate here is that given the definition I gave on the last slide, it doesn't really seem that the zero distribution is gonna be a limit of these mu n's in any reasonable sense. Uh, Cause these are distributions that you know have mass one on m equals true and one on m equals false. They don't seem to approach zero in any sense as you take n to be very large. Right? So uh, like that should be the right answer but it's probably not the limit of these things. Again, without defining what limit means. I don't want to do that. Okay. All right. So, right. So, like as I've kind of talked about, the problem of this example is that loop is not terminating. Um, so, the natural idea is that we should only count the probability mass that has terminated. So, um, you know, you kind know, of once a loop has terminated, it has all it always it is always terminated. Uh, you know, you can't terminate a loop and suddenly start the loop again. Like once the guard is false, it's always going to be false. Like after that. Um, and the rough idea is that if I define the sequence of distributions in a different way, where I only count the probability of memories that have already exited the loop and terminated, uh, then the terminated states can't oscillate, right? Because as you run the loop, the, the, there's more and more chance that your program is going to terminate. And once it terminates, it's terminated forever. Uh, so the probability of termination can only go up uh, until maybe it reaches a limit, okay? Because it can't go up past one, okay? So in this way, we can try to make these, these approximates of the loop uh, increasing in some sense and try to define a limit in this way. So a bit more formally, you know, I'm going to find yet another kind of construction on distributions. So I have some distribution on, on memories M, and I'm going to define mu square bracket E um, just to take the distribution of mu and it will erase all the memory, uh, all the mass of memory where E is going to be uh, false. Oh, sorry, sorry, where E is sorry, where E is false, okay? So uh, I have a distribution over a bunch of memories. Some of the memories E might be true and my, some of the memories E might be false. I'm just going to create a sub distribution now uh, by erasing the mass of everything where E is false, okay? So uh, this, is, this is in general gonna be a sub distribution. So I'm erasing a bunch of mass. So, you know, previously all the weights add up to one maybe, but after I do this, you know, it's quite likely they won't add up to one. it will be less than one because I've erased a chunk of probability, okay? Uh, it's also worth mentioning that this is not the same as conditioning that we talked about last time. So um, you can try to find an example where these will give you different semantics. You're not conditioning on, N, on, on E being true. That will give you, in general, a different answer. You're just erasing a bunch of mass. So one way of seeing this is that when you condition, you, you produce another distribution. Uh, but when you erase mass, you might produce a sub-distribution, something with less weight, okay? So they're, they're not the same. This one is arguably simpler. Okay, so, so what we're gonna do is that we're gonna define the loop approximants in, in this way. Okay, so I have almost the same thing as I had before. So I'm gonna have this sequence of distributions that say, you know, run the loop n times and look at the distribution after n iterations. But now I'm gonna put this kind of erasing operation that says only count the mass where E, which is the guard, is false. So only count the mass of all the memories where the loop has already terminated. If the loop has not terminated, I'm not going to take that probability. I'm just going to say that probability is zero. I'm not going to actually accumulate it as a final result because the loop is still running. So I shouldn't say that it has produced some result with some probability because it's still running. Like we don't know what's going to happen to that, that bit of mass. Okay, so and then it's kind of not, not hard to show. You can try this if you're curious that um, the subdistributions mu n are increasing in n. 
Uh, so for any memory m prime, um, you know, as I increase the index n, as I do more iterations of the loop, uh, the probability of producing m prime can only go up. It can it can never go down. And this is again because of the intuition that you know once the loop has terminated in state m prime, it is always going to be in state m prime, right? If I do one more if then else, you know, you're not going to change the m prime because the guard is false already. Like um, you know, you're not going to alter that. You might have some additional probability that you will also terminate uh, in m prime, but you're not going to reduce the probability. Okay, so uh, now these subdistributions are increasing in n. Uh, of course, the mass at any m is going to be bounded by one because the probability is bounded by one. And then you can kind of argue that you know this limit now must exist that you're going to increase, increase, and you're going to limit towards some value. You can't increase forever, you know, to infinity uh, because you're bounded by one. So you can increase the sum limiting um, distribution over memories. Okay, again, all of this can be made much more formal, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, so finally, we're going to find the loop semantics as the limit of, of approximates. Okay, so this is what we kind of want to do in the first place, uh, but now we have kind of the, the right notion of approximate. Okay. All right, so maybe I should stop here briefly to see if there are any questions. The only thing I'm going to say here is that, you know, uh, this is a very common pattern in you know, denotation semantics where you want to define the meaning of a loop in terms of, a, of, of its finite approximates. Okay, so we're just taking that idea and uh, you know, using it for probabilistic programs as well. Okay. Any questions? You just use that bounded, bounded, uh, and increase it. a monotonically increasing function that is bounded has a limit, right? That's all that you do. So yes, so, yes. Yeah, it's a point-wise limit, actually. It's yes. a point, like for every m prime, you have a limit. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Whereas before that was not the case because it was not monotone. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Questions, concerns? Um, Alvaro Santos uh, asks, um, uh, what did we lose, if anything, um, by defining our semantics to discard the cases where the loop hasn't terminated yet? Uh, I think we don't really lose very much. I think so you, okay. Let me try to make a better answer. So the, the semantics that we've given, stepping back a little bit, talks about the input output behavior of the program. You're given input some memory. I'm gonna define for you, what is the output distribution on memories? Okay, so what happens inside the program, the semantics is not going to see, like it ignores pretty much. Like whether you run one iteration or like 5,000 iterations, the semantics might be the same, okay? so. If you consider, if you want to consider semantics that was finer, that it, it paid attention to this kind of uh, this kind of information, which might be important because maybe you're trying to verify something about the running time or something, um, then you might want to know, like, you know, when or like at what point does the thing terminate, or like, um, you know, how long are, are are these these loops running for? And that's something that's not really captured by this. I'm just saying that at any step, if you haven't terminated, I'm just going to forget. I'm not going to record anything about this state at this point. You know, I have some loop that's currently running. I don't know how long it's currently run for, and I don't know how long it's still gonna run. I just know that it's not done running at this point, so I'm not gonna count it at all, okay, at this point. But of course, like, if I run the loop more, um, it's quite possible that, you know, then, then the program will terminate. And then at that point, I will record it inside the mass. So I only, I only record what happens when the loop terminates in some sense. Okay, so I only get the input and output behavior of of the program. I don't get any information about, or I don't define information about anything else in the, in the middle of execution. Um, and, and does that introduce any, any kind of sampling bias um, if, if you're only um, uh, recording uh, the, the, the terminated instances or, or is there, I mean, I guess, I guess it depends on the semantics of. of um, uh, so here, I, I think, I don't really think about there being any sampling bias. So here I'm thinking about, I'm just defining some mathematical distribution. So I'm not even trying to claim that you could actually simulate, th this is not an implementation at all, right? So uh, I'm not thinking you should implement your, your semantics this way. Like um, sometimes the semantics you could actually implement it, but in general, it's, it's maybe not the best way to implement your program by doing it like this. Um, here for our purposes, I just want to define what it means mathematically. So I'm not getting into things about uh, how do you compute this stuff uh, and things like this? Um, uh, but that, yeah. So, so 
I'm just trying to define this mathematically so there's kind of no sampling bias because we are not running the program as part of this process. I see. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm going to continue. Okay. So just going to give a quick example of how this works. So here is, uh, okay, good. So here's a, here's a loop uh, that we saw last time already. Um, it's um, going to repeatedly flip this bias coin until it comes up heads. And in the meantime, it's going to count in this variable t, um, excuse me, the number of iterations that, that the loop has made. Okay, so I'm going to suppose that the input memory has uh, initial count is equal to zero. So m of t is equal to zero. t variable is initially zero. And m of stop is initially uh, false. So the loop is entered. You don't just stop. You do enter the loop. Okay, so now we can kind of Using the definition we had before, you know, we can compute the series of approximates. So intuitively, the first approximate mu1 is going to be the distribution of stuff that has terminated after one iteration. Okay, and mu2 is going to be the distribution of stuff that has terminated after kind of at most two iterations. Okay, and then mu3 is at most three iterations, and mu4 is at most four iterations, and so on. Okay, so um, I'm not going to do this computation for you. Um, again, it's, it's a little bit messy, but not too bad. So the idea is that you know after one iteration, I have terminated with probably one quarter. And once I do that, I have uh, t equals one. Okay, so after two iterations, I have the mass I have from the first approximate, which is one quarter on t equals one. But I also have um, another bit of mass, which is like three quarters times one quarter uh, on t equals two. So this is the mass that terminates after exactly two steps. So it didn't terminate the first time, so that's three quarters. And then it did terminate the second time, so that's one quarter. Um, so you can kind of extend this out to see like you, you end up with this distribution that has uh, mass one quarter on t equals one, you know, three quarters times one quarter on t equals two, and, and so on in this kind of downward sloping, uh, sloping way, um, kind of given by this. And then kind of taking the limit as n goes infinity will give you the loop semantics. So note that kind of the right side here doesn't depend on n at all. Um, you know, in general, it might, may or may not, but in this case, it does not. So you just end up kind of adding up all the contributions from the first iteration termination, the second iteration termination, and, and so on, all the way up to you know, arbitrarily many iterations. Okay. Okay. All right, so this is uh, semantics of loops. Uh, if there's any questions, I can try to take them now. Uh, again, this is always the most uh, complicated or interesting uh, part of defining semantics for kind of looping commands uh, because you have this non-termination behavior. Okay. okay. Cool. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about for um, uh, semantics. Uh, now I want to kind of talk a little bit about the first verification method uh, that we're going to come across, uh, which is a method for reasoning about PYL programs. Uh, this is the weakest pre-explication calculus, uh, and I want to give a, a rough idea about how this works, or maybe more than a rough idea. I'm running a bit behind, but it's fine. Okay. So. One kind of pattern we're going to use is that a lot of the verification techniques we use for PYL or we know of for PYL are very closely related to existing verification techniques for a while uh, for imperative languages without random sampling. And this is because kind of syntactically, you know, while languages and PYL languages have very similar, they look for, they, they look very similar. You know, they have while if then else sequencing and stuff, and they also have similar semantics, right? So and if you take off random sampling from PYL, you will just get a, random, a standard while program that doesn't do any random sampling. Uh, but in some sense, we expect it will it does the same thing uh, as a standard while program if you just don't do random sampling. So um, what we're going to do is that uh, we're going to start with this weakest preconditions idea, this idea that goes way back to, to Dextra. Uh, and we're going to show how this idea can be adapted uh, to, to PYL programs as well. Okay, so, all right, so let's just jump in. So weakest preconditions, the idea is that you're kind of given a program and a post condition, which is some assertion. You want to find a precondition that guarantees the post condition. So a bit more formally, I'm given a program C and a post condition Q. This is something I want to hold at the end of the program. Uh, and then WP uh, of C and Q is the most general precondition that if it holds initially, then if you run C on that state, then Q will hold. So this is the least you need to assume about the input to ensure that Q is going to hold after the program. Okay, so for you know for verification, you might be wondering why this is interesting. Um, so it's quite useful because you know if I want to ensure that Q is holding on the output, 
Uh, all I have to do is check whether the input satisfies WP C of, uh, of C and Q. Okay, so in some sense, WP, this is gonna be some assertion. Um, I just have to check to see if the input satisfies this thing. And I no longer have to think about, you know, what the program does. I just, all the information about the program is summarized by this WP assertion here. Okay, so kind of, this is, this is, what, this is the guarantee that, that we have. Okay, so a few, few quick examples. Um, so, you know, example, let's say the program is, I'm gonna assign X, Y to X, and I want to ensure the post condition to be X bigger than zero. Um, what is the WP? Does anyone have a guess? Y should be greater than zero? Yes, that's right. So if Y is bigger than zero, then initially, then after the program is run, X is gonna be bigger than zero. And furthermore, it's also the weakest condition because uh, you know you at least need y to be bigger than zero in order for x to be bigger than zero at the end. Um, okay, if the, if y is not bigger than zero at the beginning, there's no way x is going to be bigger than zero. Okay, great. All right, so you know we can do more like this. So you know the program is a bit more complicated. You know I first assign y to x, and then I assign x plus one to x. I'm going to increment x. Uh, now I want the post condition to be the same thing, so I want to ensure that x is bigger than zero at the end. Uh, so what is the weakest precondition? Y should be greater than minus one. Right, so that's good. So if Y is bigger than minus one, if I run this program, I'm going to get a state where X is bigger than zero. Uh, and of course, it's the same thing where if Y is not bigger than minus one um, initially, then if I run this program, I will not end up in a state where, where X is bigger than zero. Okay, so you know, in this case, WP is, is this thing on the right. Okay. So we can easily get, make this more and more complicated. So here's like one with if then else, you know, if Z is bigger than zero, I do this kind of thing, else X gets five, same both condition X bigger than zero. And I, you could ask the question, you know, what is the WP again, right? And, you know, given some time, maybe not so much time or, or a lot of time, you can kind of try to figure out what is the WP. Um, but the point I want to emphasize is that, you know, it's getting a bit cumbersome. That program's kind of big, you know, imagine, you know, you can do this program, maybe you have like a hundred line program, like, are you going to keep doing this by hand and figuring out what is the what WP is supposed to be? Uh, it starts to get kind of difficult. So the idea behind this weakest precondition calculus is that we want to make computing WP easier. So um, we want to kind of define a way to define the WP of a complex command in terms of the WP for subcommands. So this is that principle of compositionality again, where we want to say you you compute the WP for the simpler commands and you combine those WPs to compute the WP for the big command. Uh, in this way, you can kind of compute WP for a very, very complicated program by just computing for its subcomponents and compute those things like for their subcomponents and break down this complicated task into a bunch of small parts. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna show you kind of how, how this works. Uh, again, uh, I'll try to go a little bit faster here. Um, hopefully this is, this is not, so, not so difficult or not, not so unclear. Um, so, okay, let's say we always start with a simple program skip, so the post conditions queue so to ensure Q holds after, afterwards, uh, Q must hold before. So the WP of skip and Q is just gonna be defined to be equal to Q. So this is maybe def defined to be equal to. Okay, so if Q holds initially, then I run skip, then Q, Q holds afterwards. And you know that's hopefully uh, fairly reasonable. Uh, for assignments, um, you know again, assignments, I have a post nation is gonna be Q and I wanna ensure Q holds afterwards. Um, for this to be, uh, True, then I initially Q must hold where X uh, is replaced by E. Okay, so uh, if you've seen horror logic, this is kind of the horror logic assignment rule in a different form. Um, people always get confused if you haven't seen this before. Uh, you can do like a brief check to see like, okay, so if I have a command where X is incremented and I want to make sure that X is bigger than zero at the end, then it suffices to in, uh, assume that X plus one is bigger than zero initially, uh, which is X is bigger than negative one, uh, as, as we said before. Okay, sequencing uh, WP is, is very easy to define. Uh, essentially, you can kind of compute WP in this backwards fashion where you want to say, you know, I want to ensure Q holds after C1 and C2. So WP, if I use WP to move the Q before the C2, I'm going to have the condition I need before C2 to ensure that, ensure that Q holds after C2. That's going to be some assertion again. So now I can use WP again on that thing to move it past C1. Say, what do I need? Um, before C1 uh, to hold in order for the intermediate assertion to hold, which will ensure that C2 holds after, uh, ensures that Q holds after C2. 
Okay, so kind of WP can be just composed together uh, like this. So for sequencing, WP looks something like this. So, you know, I'm going to first compute WP of C2 and Q. It's going to be some assertion. Then I'm going to compute WP of C1 and that thing. That's going to be some other assertion. And I, I work in this kind of backwards style. Um, any questions at this point? Okay. So maybe multiple, I mean, this, since it's a sequence, uh, C1 and C2, um, isn't it possible that there is some other WP prime C2Q and under the uh, inside instance WP C2Q and other uh, WP double prime C1 of WP prime C2Q? Q and up dance? So, so here I'm just defining. So here, like, I think the way I think about this, oh, this is, uh, is okay. either I'm just okay. defining what WP is going to be here. So okay. uh, this is just a definition. I'm, I'm only defining one WP. Uh, this is going to be the thing. Uh, you're right that, you know, I said that WP should mean this thing uh, intuitively. Uh, here, I'm just, just think about, I'm just defining WP purely right. syntactically. Just this right. is the definition of WP. Right. Uh, later on, you will have to prove that this definition actually matches up with what I said before. But that, that would be a thing you have to prove, like a theorem you have to prove. Right. Uh, I'm not defining that to be the WP anymore. Okay. But so there's just one WP and this this is it. Okay. Cool. Uh, conditionals, uh, again, you can do this kind of thing. So, you know, um, I'll just show you what this thing looks like. Uh, it's a little bit getting a little bit uglier, but still, you know, you can kind of see that the WP of this conditional is kind of built out of. Uh, WP of the first branch and WP of the second branch. Okay, so intuitively, initially, if E is true, then to ensure that Q is holding after the conditional, uh, I must know that uh, WP C1 of Q holds, uh, like I, because I'm going to go through the, the branch C1. And if E is not true, then a WP of C2 of Q must hold. Okay. Okay, so this conditionals, and you know, we can already kind of exercise what's going on here uh, with this. So, you know, this is the more complicated example I showed at the very last one. Um, you know, I'm not going to step this one by one, but you know, you can just unfold the definition of WP and just repeatedly apply WP to kind of compute this thing. Okay, so it's, it's, I'm not saying it's the most elegant thing in the world, uh, but at least it's entirely mechanical, right? You just have to apply the definition, you substitute some stuff, you get another assertion, and then you apply it again. Um, so you can just apply what we've seen before to kind of compute the WP of this program and more complicated programs. Okay. Okay. So this is the game of making WP easier to compute. So the thing I've skipped so far is that you know WP for loops. Um, you know the, the main problem is that this is not going to be easy to compute. Uh, there's a definition you can define it, but it's defined in this in terms of this least fixed point, and if you try to compute it directly. Uh, you might have to unroll this loop many, many times, and that's that's not so good. So the idea to make this easier is that we want to, um, we don't want to, you know, we often don't need to compute the WP for a loop. Okay, so we're going to make the task a bit easier, like computing this thing exactly could be really complicated, um, it might be really ugly, but we don't need to do that necessarily. So the simpler problem we're going to kind of frame this as is that I know some precondition now, um, some precondition P. I know this is going to hold initially. And I just want to check, does P imply WP uh, of the loop, right? So does P imply that the loop is going to end in Q, uh, satisfying Q? OK. So you know, I might not want to know exactly what is this crazily complicated WP formula for loops, but I just want to know, does, does my precondition imply that thing? OK. Um, so then using this thing, we can uh, use what's called invariant rules to, to check this thing. Okay, so here the invariant rule looks, looks something like this. Um, so I have a program that's, you know, while well, E do C and I have a precondition P and a postcondition Q. So now I assume also I have a precondition that I want to check, you know, it, it does precondition P imply Q after the loop. So if we know that there is some, uh, if we know an, an, uh, an assertion I, the invariant, uh, and I satisfies the following three conditions, uh, then P implies a WP. Okay, so then, then this thing that we want to check uh, holds. Okay, so kind of, we want to check this final thing. So we just need to find this invariant I satisfying these three conditions. And these three conditions are fairly easy to check, right? So they're much easier to check because I don't have to compute the WP of a loop anymore. Um, there's the last condition involves WP of the, of the loop body, which is C. So maybe C has more loops inside but I can just apply this thing again, right? Um, I can apply this thing again, 
uh, maybe find another invariant for the thing inside. And again, I don't have to actually compute the WP of a loop. I can just, uh, you know, again, reduce the problem to checking these three conditions. Okay, so I'm trying to illustrate that, you know, you need to find this magic I invariance, uh, but if you can find it, then checking the conditions uh, is an easier task uh, than, than the thing we're trying to do down here. Okay. Okay, so I mean, you can, uh, these are fairly, not too hard to understand, but maybe I'll, I'll go with it, skip over this uh, to keep on moving forward. Um, right, so you have to find this magically, find this variant I, and this in general can be very difficult. Okay, just wanna kind of show an example of how this works. Um, so my program here is gonna be, while well, n is bigger than zero, I'm going to decrement n by two, okay? And the precondition I have is that uh, n is even, so n mod two is equal to zero, n is even, and n is bigger than or equal to zero, okay? And the post condition I want to show is that n is equal to zero. And so I, I want to show that if I start in some state where n is even and I run this loop, I'm gonna terminate in some state where n is equal to zero. And rather than, you know, if I start this thing in a, in a state where n is odd, you, know, you can kind of see that I'm going to decrement from one down to negative one, and I'm not going to end up with uh, n is equal to zero. Like, I'm going to skip zero. So, you know, like I said, you have to find some invariant. I'm just going to say that this is an invariant for your loop. Um, you know, how you come up with this, you have to you know, think a lot, or maybe you can use some automated heuristics or whatever. Uh, but once you have this thing, it's easy to check the invariant conditions. So you have to check these three invariant conditions um, and you can check these things um, and show that indeed uh, they do kind of satisfy. They're all satisfied. Okay, so once you have these things, then, then you know, it, it does show that kind of P implies though, your precondition implies the weakest precondition of the loop, which means that if P holds initially, then Q is gonna hold after your loop. Okay. Any questions about this so far. So this so far, this is all for deterministic programs. We have no randomization at all. This is something that uh, maybe many of you have seen before. If you haven't seen before, it's I think it's good to know about you know weakest preconditions for imperative programs. What does this make P the weakest precondition? So the weakest precondition means that um, okay. it's the least you have to assume of the input to assume that the post condition holds. Right. Yeah. There are many things you could assume about the input that would lead to the post condition holding. Right. So you you could assume false. At the input, right. uh, which is impossible, right? So if you assume that the input is impossible, then any precondition, uh, any postcondition will hold because there are no inputs that are actually valid. But that's not that so interesting because you know you want to assume something weaker, All right? So the weakest precondition is uh, the 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 least you have to assume uh, in order for Q to hold at the end of the program. There's issues with termination that I'm kind of starting here, um, but you know that's what weakest means. Yeah. Okay. All right. Other questions. Uh, so uh, David Van Bellen asks, um, uh, does this mean that uh, it's very hard to disprove um, that P implies uh, WP? Uh, maybe you can read it in the chat because it would be difficult to. Uh, uh, I'll read it in the chat, yes. Uh, yeah, it's quite hard to disprove this. Well, I don't know. It depends on what you mean by disprove. Right, like um, the question is like, is it quite hard to disprove that P implies WP of a loop because we have to show there's no such invariant. Um, you can, you could kind of disprove this in a simpler way. You don't have to show that there's no such invariant. Like you could disprove it by, for instance, finding some input that satisfies P that when you run the loop, you don't get Q, right? That's one way of disproving this, right? Um, so I, I think probably that's, uh, there might be other ways you could have of disproving this. Yeah, well, you could just run it, but you have to find it also. And like maybe finding is not so easy. So I'm, I'm not saying this is super easy either, uh, but it's certainly not requiring you to show that there is no invariant. That, that's, that's for sure. Okay. Um, okay, that's a good question. All right, so let's get a little bit into weakest pre-expectations. Um, so we want to generalize this to probabilistic programs. Okay, so uh, all of this technique technology was developed by kind of um, uh, Annabelle MacGyver and Carol Morgan, um, and I just I think it's a nice tool, basic tool for reasoning about PWAP programs. So the main idea is going to be this, right? So we're going to we're going to generalize uh, these predicates P and Q to be real valid versions of the predicates. Right? So before I had this predicate P, right, it's an assertion. 
given some memory, you get true or false, right? It's a, it's a Boolean. It holds or doesn't hold, depending on, on your point of view. Uh, now, an expecta expectation, which I'm going to write E for, is going to be a map from memories to uh, non-negative real numbers. So uh, instead of giving this binary thing where either it's true or false, uh, yes or no, I'm going to give you like a weight, like a, a number from zero up to, uh, you know, anything. Okay. So this is an expectation. Well, this, I'm going to call this an expectation. So, so far, there's no connection to expected value or average or whatever. I'm just going to call this thing to be an expectation. Um, because that's what uh, Morgan and MacGyver called it. Okay, so for some examples, you know, you know, E might be a numeric expression, right? So if X, Y, and Z are program variables um, and they're all numeric, uh, then they're all expectations because each of them uh, maps a memory to a real number. Or more precisely, the semantics of each of them is an expectation. Uh, but I'm gonna blur the difference between the semantics and the syntax here, just temporarily. Also expressions like, um, you know, X plus Y, uh, it's also going to be expectation. So given any memory, you can compute some number that is going to be the value of x plus y, x plus y, and, and so on. OK, uh, another kind of useful uh, expectation uh, is an indicator function. Right? So this is kind of a way to embed a binary predicate into an expectation. So to view a binary predicate as an expectation. So if p is, is a binary predicate, like a standard predicate, then the indicator function is a square bracket p. This is the function that maps a memory to one if p of m is true and zero if p of m is false. Okay, so I'm kind of converting this binary predicate to be expectation by either making it do zero or one, depending on whether it's true or false. Okay. Any questions about this so far? Okay, so, you know, what do expectations mean in a positive state? So, you know, we have these predicates like I talked about before, and the, the meaning in a state is uh, hopefully not too hard to think about. So in a state, a predicate is either true or false. So it holds or doesn't hold. Like x is bigger than zero, or it's not bigger than zero in, in some memory. Um, so expectation is a little bit weirder because it maps each uh, memory to a number. So it's not that it holds or doesn't hold because it's not, it's not binary. It's not true or false. But in some memory, you know, it's going to give you a number, right? And uh, in a probabilistic state, you might even need to think about what does expectation mean in a distribution over memories. Okay, so the way one way to think about this is that you know the value of a predicate p in a memory m is going to be zero if false and one if true, and the value of an exp expectation e in a distribution over memories is just the average of e over mu. So um, I have an expectation, I have a distribution, and I'm going to compute a value by averaging e over the distribution of mu. Okay, that's, I'm not really motivating yet why this is a useful thing to think about, uh, but in the next slides, I'll talk about that. Okay, so one reason this is useful is that many kind of things you might care about of, of a distribution of states, you can encode as an average of an expectation. So one thing you might care about is the probability of, of some event. Okay, so uh, I have mu as a distribution over memories, and uh, let's say that E is this is the expectation x equals y. So this is the indicator of x equals y. So then, then we have that the probability of x equals y in mu, this is something that you might want to compute or care about. Um, this is gonna be just the average of e over mu, okay, by, by definition. Okay, so uh, by picking this expectation in, in this clever way, or maybe not so clever way, uh, computing this average is going to give me the probability that x equal to y, which is the thing that maybe I care about. Questions about this? Okay, I'll show one more example. Um, this is kind of encoding an average as an expectation. So another thing you might care about in a distribution is what is the average value of something, right? So maybe mu is the distribution of memories and uh, E is the expectation T, where T is a variable that holds the running time. Okay, so I, I want to figure out uh, what is the average running time of my program? Like what is the average value of T in the final distribution? And then the average running time is just going to be the average of e uh, over mu again. So again, I can average some expectation over the distribution to compute some quantity that I care about, which is the average running time. Okay, so you know I can encode averages and probabilities all by doing this thing where I'm averaging some expectation e uh, over the distribution. Okay. Okay, so you know these are the probabilities you might care about and how you can encode them as averaging an expectation over a distribution. Okay, 
So now the weakest pre-expectation uh, developed by uh, Karen Morgan and Anna MacGyver uh, is again a similar kind of concept. It's a kind of a generalization or maybe kind of a, a something that's very similar to Dexter's weakest preconditions that we just saw before. Um, so the idea is that you're given a probabilistic program C, a PWA program, and you're given an expectation E, which I'm going to call the post expectation, like a like post condition. So I want to find this thing, WPE of C and E, which is again an expectation. And this expectation is going to compute the average value of E in the output distribution after running C. So the idea is that this thing here, the WPE, if I plug in some, some memory here, it's going to give me a number. And this number is going to be equal to the expected value of E in the output of C if I run C on the state I plugged in. So that was kind of, kind of a mouthful. So uh, maybe kind of this definition down here is, is a little bit simpler. So for any input state M, uh, the average value of E in the output distribution uh, CM is, should be exactly WPE CE uh, applied to M. Okay. So again, I kind of try to motivate that things that you might care about in the output distribution, the quantities that you might want to compute or, or bound or whatever, they can be expressed as averaging E over the output distribution. So again, if I want to uh, kind of compute the average value of E in the, in the output, I just have to evaluate WPE uh, of C and E on the input M. Okay, so again, I kind of go from the output to something property of the, in, of the input. It's not really a property anymore. It's more like a numeric function. So this is a little bit, a little bit strange if you haven't seen this before, which I expect is maybe maybe many of you. So let's look at a few quick examples. Uh, sorry, this is the key property. Uh, well, I don't know. There's so many M's there. Uh, oops. Okay. Before you, you give the example, yep. uh, maybe Justin, um, Alex Lev asks, uh, is there a sense um, in which the this is uh, the, the weakest still, or is, is there only one choice? Right. I think in this, so in the setting here, I think, yeah, I think there's a few, so there's a few things that, that uh, make this the weakest. I think in the original stuff by Morgan and MacGyver, they consider a language with also non-determinism, uh, where you have probabilistic and a non-deterministic choice. And therefore, there might be a range of possible distributions that your program is going to produce, depending on how the non-intrinsic choice is resolved. So then the weakest one will be like kind of the, the maybe the, the, the best lower bound, maybe, or the best upper bound on the expected value. Um, I think for our purposes, there's just going to be just one, I think. Uh, of course, there are some subtleties also around what happens if your program is not terminating. Like, do you count that as zero weights or count that as something else? Uh, but I'm mostly going to just avoid those difficulties right now and not try not to get into those. But largely, you can think about them having just one thing, right? So kind of in this key property I put here, uh, fortunately, um, this is kind of what the, what the weakest pre-expectation should satisfy. Because okay. our language does not have non-deterministic choice, just has probabilistic choice. OK. OK, uh, did that answer your question, Alex? Or, uh, if not, I guess a good follow-up. Thanks. Cool, cool. OK. Sounds good. OK, so let's see some examples real quick, and then probably I'll be out of time for today. Um, OK, so let's start with a simple program. This is a, a bias coin flip again. Um, I'm going to flip a bias coin and store into variable z. So the expectation is going to be the indicator function of z. So it's going to be 1 if z is true at the end of the program, and 0 if z is false at the end of the program. Uh, so can anyone tell me what the WP of this should be? So the WP should kind of say, this is the expected value of, the, of this thing at the end of the program. It should be P, good, it should be P, right? So this is gonna be one if Z is true and zero if Z is false. Right, so what is the expected value of that? Where well, there's p chance of z being true, and one minus p chance of p uh, of z being zero, so the expected value should be p times one, which is p. Okay, great. So you know this average value of z after running this is also the probability of that z equals equal to true, uh, which is just p. Okay, let's do a 
a different one. Uh, this one might be a little bit tricky to compute, or maybe not. So here's your program. It's going to roll a dice and store it into x, and then roll another dice and store it into y. And now the post expectation is going to be x plus y. So now, what is the WP? Does anyone want to guess? Seven. Seven is good. Right, so it should be seven. So why should it be seven? So average value of x plus y after rolling two dice is going to be the average value of x plus average value of y. Um, the average value of x is going to be 3.5. If you just average, like, what is the average thing you get from rolling one dice? one die, you'll get 3.5, and you have two of these things, so it's 3.5 plus 3.5 equals 7. Okay, so already it's like already doing some kind of reasoning here that is maybe you might imagine like how would you possibly make this mechanical or like possible to do in a, in a, in a general way because I need to say, oh, it's the, I notice it's the average value of a sum and therefore it's the average value of x plus the average value of y. Uh, this is the kind of thing that, you know, a human can kind of do at least on small programs. Um, but you might wonder like how we, we do this more in a more principled way, but, but we will see. Okay, so here is kind of where I'm probably gonna stop for today. Like, you know, you know, we, you know, how do we make computing the weakest pre expectation easier, right? So we're gonna do the same ideas we did for WP, uh, Dexter's WP, where I want to now define WP in a compositional way. So I'm gonna compute the WP of a program from the WPs of smaller subprograms. Again, we're trying to break down a complicated thing into smaller parts. So, you know, I look at a smaller program that's simpler, I want to do WP of that, and I break it down into smaller pro and smaller programs uh, that are easier and easier to analyze. And I combine all the parts together to give the WP for the whole program. Um, right, okay, you know, this is a long line of work that I have, you know, will not really be able to summarize. I'm just going to only be able to skim over. Um, and you know, it, as I mentioned, it also they also consider non deterministic choice, which we won't really consider here. Okay. okay, so maybe I'll do a few cases, and then I, I think I'll probably stop. So you know, WPE calculus of skip. Um, you know, here's a program is going to be skip. Post expectation is going to be e. So that an average value of e after running the skip program um, is just the value of e before the program, right? because the skip program doesn't really do anything. It just takes any memory the same thing. So I want to say, you know, what is the average value of e after? It's just the average value of e before. Okay, so WP of e of skip e is just going to be equal to e. Okay, so if you start to realize this looks very similar to Dextra's weakest preconditions, where also we had WP of skip of p is equal to p. But there p was a predicate, like a state assertion, and here e is an expectation. So it's a real value thing. But syntactically, it looks really similar. Um. Arthur and Chung uh, would like to know um, in what sense this weakest pre-expectation is a pre-expectation. Uh, so what, why is it called a pre? Yeah, it's, it's a, that's a good question. Like for precondition, you can kind of say, oh, this is what needs to hold before the program in order for Q to hold after the program. For expectations, like I was trying to emphasize that syntactically it looks very similar, but the meaning is really different now because there's not really any like implication anymore. Right. This is not really a logical formula. It's some numeric expression that, you know, it doesn't imply something else. Um, I think one way to think about pre-expectation is that the, the pre-expectation is evaluated in the pre-state. So the state before the program, you know, so the post-expectation E. So if E is a post-expectation, it means I want to evaluate E in the post-state. So the state after the program. And how do I evaluate it? Where I uh, average E over the output distribution. Okay. Now I want to compute a pre-expectation, which again is an expectation, but now this thing should be evaluated in the input state, okay, which is just a single state. Okay. So uh, going back here, kind of this E is a post-expectation here, and I average it over the output distribution, which is CM. On the left side, the pre-expectation is evaluated in uh, on, on memory M, which is the input to the program. Okay, so the pre-expectation is evaluated before the program executes, and the post-expectation is evaluated after the program executes. And the idea is that there should be some connection on, on these two things, between these two things. Does that, does that answer your question? I, I think so. Um, but so what would an example of a, a, a weakest post-expectation or strongest post-expectation be? Um, That's... 
Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think I have a great answer for that off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, if we're for like in Dextras or in the standard program uh, programming languages without public choice, you have kind of strongest post conditions and things like this. I'm pretty sure that Morgan and MacGyver have probably considered these this forward kind of reasoning where you're trying to go from pre to post. Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head, so I should probably probably not answer. Yeah, something that is probably possible as well, uh, but. Okay, uh, skip, I mean, I'll just do one more assignment and then I'll stop. So assignments, you know, the program is, you know, X gets E, the post expectation is, is E. And again, the average value of E after the program is just E before the program where X is replaced by the expression little e. So uh, again, you have this WP for assignment that again, looks very similar to the WP kind of rule for, for assignment for kind of standard programs. Okay, but again, here E is an expectation, it's not a predicate anymore. It's a real valued thing that doesn't mean a logical uh, assertion anymore. But syntactically, it still looks the same. Okay, so I think I should probably stop here because my time, time is up. Um, I think next time we'll just pick up here and kind of continue showing the WP uh, calculus and, and see how, how it works. Uh, if any questions, uh, I'll hang around a few more minutes. Uh, otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. Great. Thanks, Tristan. Um, we'll see everyone then tomorrow yep. for the next set of lectures. Tomorrow, you mean Monday, right? That's true. Yeah, we're actually, yes. we have yeah, Sunday Monday. off. We'll be back on right, Monday. Monday. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Right, uh, one quick question. I think uh, Arthur has a question like, can't you compute the expectation from the denotation of the program? Um, yes, this is, this, is a good, this is a good point. Right, so you might say, oh, the WP, like I want to compute the expected value of something after the program. Why don't I just take the program semantics, which I've defined before, like painfully on all those slides, I just take that thing and I just compute the distribution and then I just evaluate the expected value. So in principle, you could do this. Um, well, for loops, it starts getting more difficult. Like how do you compute that limit? It may not be so clear, um, but a lot of what we're trying to do here is try to prove properties without unfolding the semantics because the semantics tends to be difficult to work with. It's really complicated. And you know, even for a simple program, computing that distribution explicitly uh, can be really difficult. Right, like uh, it might not be something you want to do. So in contrast, all of these methods we have here kind of work just on the program text somehow. So they're syntactic or, uh, you know, they, they use some logical formulas that you're trying to prove implications between. At no point do we ever have to look at the program and compute the semantics and then evaluate that distribution because this is in general an intractable thing to do. So we want to avoid that. So that, that's what we're trying to avoid. I have a, a question, which was, what was the, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, like what was the intuition behind uh, the choice? Like when we were trying to define the semantics, we said that we want to choose a notion over memory. Is it either a single memory location or a distribution over memory locations? How did we know that to define the semantics for this program, we need to be considering the notion of memory? Right, so the notion of memory, that's a good question. So the notion of memory, uh, I've essentially lifted directly from the semantics for standard while languages, so for imperative programs without random sampling. Um, so I just took that and added probabilistic stuff on top of it. Okay. Um, so that's the standard semantics for imperative programs. Um, I, there's other semantics that are, are, are possible that are, that are different, mm -hmm. um, but I, I would think this is kind of an intuitive way of modeling input output behavior of an imperative program. Um, it's just the models of the, you know, can make other choices as well. Okay, thank you. Yep. Other questions? Um, I, I don't see any in the chat, but maybe uh, I had one. Um, yeah, so the other day, um, kind of thinking about you're you're talking about um, uh, fresh and and uh, and and how how you you determine whether. Um, uh, so something is, is, is a new um, instance that we need to draw a sample. And um, uh, this also kind of came up in, um, uh, in, in 
in a recent paper on name generation. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I understand what, what the difficulty there is or why, um, maybe this is kind of unrelated to what you're discussing, but why, um, why, why is it important to, uh, to keep track of, of, of names? Maybe it's just like a high level um, question. There. Yeah, so it is something like I think I am I'm aware of the paper you're talking about. So involving name generation and probabilistic programs, right? By Sam Staten, yes, yeah. Dario Stein, and some other folks, I think. Yeah, so that yeah. I think that's a really neat paper, which I definitely will not be getting into here. Um, uh, I guess I'm definitely not an not an expert in kind of name generation or kind of nominal nominal stuff. Um, but as I understand it, it's a, it's a long line of research in, in programming languages and semantics on trying to understand what it, ne what it means for a name to be fresh, uh, what it means to bind a name inside a scope. So these are common operations you have inside programming languages. For instance, for functional languages, you have a notion of binding, a notion of fresh name, a notion of like, you know, alpha equivalence, like renaming stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of investigation, I, I guess, still continuing on, you know, what that means mathematically um, and, you know, how you can kind of prove that some piece of thing is invariant under name permutation or things like this. Uh, and like a fresh name is, is important because it, it somehow doesn't overlap with anything else. Um, and so I think this recent paper you're talking about kind of uh, made a connection between that existing concept, which has nothing to do with policy programs and make a connection to kind of policy programs. We also have a notion of freshness of a fresh sample, which behaves somewhat similarly if you look at it the right way. Um, so that, that, I well, think that's a, a very cool paper. Yeah, yeah, I, I have to uh, look into it more, more closely. But I know there was some connection to Professor Harper's lecture the other day about nominal typing. And, uh, I thought maybe- um, Cool, maybe, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think uh, it, it's, uh, they, 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 look this, they look quite similar. Um, 